creator of our beautiful world, the stars in the heavens, and our very own hearts. We give you thanks and praise and call on your power and your blessed presence. Be with us tonight. Sharpen our minds, stir up our community wisdom, strengthen our community resolve. You called us forth to be good stewards of our precious earth, to till it and care for it so that it might sustain not only our generation, but the generations to come. We ask you to deepen our love for our life-sustaining planet home, that what we pass on to our children and their children's children is life-giving and a sign of your love for all your creation and of our love. Ultimately, Holy One, we know that is why you have called us to this great work. You call us to care for our own well-being and those with whom we share this place, now and into the unimaginable future. Let this be the legacy that we leave our children and the children of the future, that we care enough about them to endure this struggle. That we look carefully at the patch of our planet that you have entrusted to us and saw your handiwork and loved it and respected it. That we supported one another in our efforts to restore health to our region. That we faithfully tilled the earth and cared for it. Though we may have come tonight weary from the day's labor, tired of the struggle, frustrated with the dance of denial, we come together in your healing presence and we can go on. We ask your grace and your guidance on all those who will ultimately make decisions about Westlake, that the decisions they make are those that best serve common good. Guide and grace us as we gather, Holy One. We place our hope in you. Amen. Thank you, Sister Jean. Um, I'm here in Nickel, in case you don't know who I am. Um, I'm one of the four moms with Just Moms STL. Um, you may often hear us referred to as the moms or the Westlake Moms. Uh, we have Don Chapman, Beth Strohmeyer, and Debbie Disser down here are the other three. We also have Angie Hubling from Coldwater Creek, Just the Facts Facebook group and that organization. Um, I would like to take this time right now and recognize the elected officials we have with us. If you could please just stand and uh, let us know who you are tonight.
Anybody new? Okay. Um, so you all know that there's information on the back table. Just a little quick update that we are now at 3,363 members on our Facebook group. Um, also, we have our website, stlradwastelegacy.com, where you can go and get history and news stories and upcoming events. Um, as most of you know, we've been sending around the red, little red bucket. We don't have our little red bucket girl here tonight, so. Um, we've been passing this bucket around for our community to be able to obtain independent soil sampling and help cover costs of promoting and educating the issues concerning the landfill. Because of the donations you are making, it allows this community to seek the truthful answers we deserve. We also have started a GoFundMe account. If you've been on Facebook, you might have seen it. Um, in just a couple of days, we've raised $240 on there. And as of today, total, we are at $1,278. Um, we have the DNR odor form up here. If some of you are not familiar with that. To be filling that out whenever you encounter the odor, DNR changed it up a little bit a couple of weeks ago and I think made it a little easier to uh, fill out the date and the time and the strength, odor strength. And uh, it just seems to be easier and I don't think we're getting as many complaints, Debbie, are we people having problems doing that? So we're glad that they were able to hopefully get that fixed for us. Uh, if you don't have that access to a computer, you can always call the DNR. The number is listed up there, but it's 314-416-2960. So tonight, you will hear from Don Chapman. Assistant Fire Chief Matt Levanti should be joining us real soon. Um, Ed Smith with the Missouri Coalition for the Environment. We're going to have a Q&A at the end of the session and um, try to, our speakers, try to repeat the question so that everyone in the audience all the way back and to the sides can hear. So I'm going to turn it over to Don Chapman. Okay, before we get into uh, the press conference today and what happened with that um, Attorney General Coster lawsuit, I want to repeat something that Sister Jean just said in her prayer um, because I think that really sums up how everyone's feeling tonight. Um, frustrated with the dance of denial. I think that that really kind of sums up where we are right now in this community, not just with the fire, but with the radioactive waste. Um, like Karen said, we're trying very hard to get these documents out. Um, you'll hear in a few minutes from Ed Smith on the latest 2005 DNR off-site samples that were just discovered after being out for a decade that shed new light on um, radiation that's left Westlake landfill. But for now, um, AG Coster delivers for impacted communities. This is a huge win for this community. We got a lot of really great things out of today. The first year. You know, they're supplying all the data, and so is Pattonville Fire Department in St. Louis County. There's a whole behind-the-scenes team effort going on just on the fire situation. So the first one is comprehensive air monitoring. Three comprehensive tests before August 2015, one every six months. First test begins within 45 days. These are very expensive tests, and, you know, I know you guys can smell, so you know what's, you know, you know you smell what's coming out, and Right now, if you get on the DNR's website, you'll notice that they are, with their area array monitors, keeping track of what's coming out. The problem is, is that some of these chemicals are really complex and it's difficult. They need to be isolated because all lumped together, you don't know which one is causing the majority of the odor. Do you kind of understand what I'm saying? Each one of these is dangerous in and of itself and it has its own tolerable level 
for acute and chronic exposure. And so what this will do is this will break everything apart so we can actually see, you know, dioxins, furans, other things that are coming out and kind of give us a more complete picture and hopefully aid in um, St. Louis County and, and, you know, the fire district on their emergency plan, whatever that ends up looking like. So carbon monoxide data, um, Assistant Fire Chief Matt LeManch is going to talk about that a little bit, but um, in the neck of the landfill every 30 days, and in the north and south quarry every 60 days, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I believe the neck of the landfill was every 60 days. So they got that every month now. I think that that was moved up. So um, here's another really big one. Republic Services Refunding State of Missouri will pay the state of Missouri up to $1.49 million. If you guys didn't think that this was affecting the tax base here in St. Louis, the people that live in Baldwin and Creek Corps and whatnot, their taxes are going to Missouri so Missouri can help fight this fire. So they're trying to recoup some of those expenses. This is a very expensive, dangerous situation happening here in Bridgeton. And this one, this one area right here shows how much of a regional issue it, it is. Odor reducing activities, 35 frack tanks removed from service. The frack tanks are the tanks that the leachate is being held in. Um, every time you open the lid on those, all these fumes come out, so that's expected to reduce it. Leachate pretreatment system fully operational by June 30th. Um, if you get on the DNR's website, you'll see pictures of those big storage tanks that they've built and the, um, they've got like a whole community up there that they've really, they've really established and in those are those storage tanks. Um, if you think of a swimming pool, you know, the stuff that's coming out of the landfill, this leachate, it's very toxic and you know, it's like having to shock your swimming pool before you open it for the summer. It goes in there and it's stored in there and then it's treated and then after it gets to a certain level, it can be released to MSD because as it stands right now, it's too toxic. It's too toxic to go to MSD. It overloads their system. So, um, natural gas backup for flares. Background levels versus remediation levels. Um, Please don't be afraid to raise your hand or go like this if it's a little over your head, but it's really important that you guys understand this because we're expecting test results from Everline and from EPA at any day. So we will let you know as soon as they come in. Um, those test results um, will be QA, QC. If you guys remember, that was one of the critiques that EPA had about the Gamma Pal is that it was just the results from that. There was no QA, QC. Um, the moment we saw that we had an issue with the gamma pal with that spike, we went ahead and paid to send them to Eberline. It's one of the top labs in the nation. It's very expensive. We were only able to send two samples. It was that expensive. But, um, you know, we understand EPA's reluctance to accept results. However, hopefully from a certified lab, that's QA, QC, and one of the labs that they choose to use often, it'll be different. Um, the reason it's important, and I'm going to try and bring this down just a little bit on your level, is anyone here not familiar with background? So if you go, and I know it's, it's interesting because we're talking about St. Louis here, so you, you wouldn't go to Florissant to get a natural background. It's not going to happen. But theoretically, in an area that's not contaminated, Whatever's outside of your house, whatever's naturally occurring, that's the background. So one of the things that we use this number, so this 1.3 is for a radium 226 level. One of the things you would do is if you take a soil sample, so if you know that that's your background, you take a soil sample, if it's over that, then it's over background. So you have something there that's not necessarily naturally occurring. And then, the other cleanups that you see, so you see background, you'll see DOE, you'll see FUSREP, and you'll see EPA. In all the sites across St. Louis and in North County and downtown Malincroft, all these cleanup sites, and across the nation, there are, depending on who owns the site, so whether it is FUSREP, whether it's a Superfund site, these sites all have to be cleaned up to certain levels. So, and unfortunately, each agency has different level. EPA's is the highest. Um, 
We did verify 7.5. We did verify this with them at the CAG meeting um, that that was that was their cleanup standard for radium. FUSREP is a five. DOE is 2.5. It's important because when we get our lab results back and when EPA's results come back, what you'll be able to do is you'll be able to take the number on the sample and look up here and see where it falls. Does that make sense? Unfortunately, well, not one of the worst things because you don't really, you know, we, we know that we probably have elevated levels. What you, what you hope for, you don't want it to reach a cleanup level, but at the same time, it's important to know what we do if it falls between. Does that make sense? What happens if we have a level that's above 1.3 but falls below 2.5? What does that mean for this community? Those are some of the questions that we're going to have to ask. Um, also, what happens if they use EPA's cleanup standard? So let's say we're talking BMEC. If they use that on the ball field, what happens if you have a level that falls in between DOE and FUSREP? So then, are we stuck with the ball field? Are we stuck with areas, including the side of the roads, that if it were under DOE or under FUSREP would be cleaned up because it's not, we have to, we have, to have a higher standard. Um, does everybody understand that? I'm trying to kind of keep it low, okay. I'm gonna have Ed Smith come up. If we need to go back to that chart, please, please let us know. I'm sorry. On the last slide, really. Pico Curie's program. And we'll make sure um, all the test results that are released are put in that standard, okay? Good evening, everyone. My name's Ed Smith. I work for the Missouri Coalition for the Environment. Um, if you've been here before, you might have heard me do this. Um, we we're going to put this up here for newcomers. Uh, this is a brief history of how we got to where we're at now. Um, in 1942, the federal government started trying to uh, build a nuclear weapon as part of World War II's efforts. The Manhattan Energy District contract with Malincroft Chemical Works to purify uranium at a commercial scale, which had never been done before. Malincroft was successful in just over 50 days. And then on December 2nd, 1942, the first self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction took place underneath the football field at the University of Chicago. Um, because this was a wartime effort, it was secret, this had never been done before, the, the, the full medical knowledge of ionizing radiation in human health wasn't as well established as it is today. Um, a lot of this stuff was, was not handled properly. Um, and a lot of the uh, purification of the ore, there was a lot of valuable material left over as well. Uh, it came from a, a, a mine in the Belgian Congo where the ore was up to 60% pure uranium, kind of a freak mine. Uh, we have about 1% to 2% uh, uranium in the southwest where we mine uranium. Um, a lot of these wastes from downtown were then moved out to the St. Louis airport. Uh, North County was just on the cusp of being developed. It was a rural area at the time. It was stored along the northern edge of the airport property, right next to Coldwater Creek. Um, that's uh, a big portion of what helped contaminate Coldwater Creek with radioactivity. Uh, the federal government, because there was a lot of value in the ore, put a proposal out there, a request for proposal to uh, businesses to buy the leftover ore that was at the airport. That changed hands a couple times. Ended up with the Cotter Corporation that moved it to Laddie Avenue, just north of the airport in Hazelwood um, in, in the 60s. In 1973, the Atomic Energy Commission uh, told Cotter Corporation they needed to clean up the, the Laddie Avenue site. And uh, what Cotter Corporation ended up doing was shipping some of that material out to Colorado where uh, it was uh, processing some of this material. What they were doing at the Laddie Avenue site was drying out these wastes. They were wet and heavy, so they were trying to save money, so they dried them out so you could transport lighter uh, material, which ended up saving money. Um, the company sent the rest of the waste out to Colorado, um, and then there was 8,700 tons of what was called leached barium sulfate left over at the landfill. They spread it across the entire complex and graded the top 12 to 18 inches of dirt from the landfill, totaling about 50,000 tons, 
and hauled it over here to Westlake Landfill in 1973 and uh, dumped it here illegally. Uh, it was used as landfill cover. 1974, the radioactive uh, portions of the Westlake Landfill were closed off. An Atomic Energy Commission uh, report on the decommissioning of the Laddie Avenue site uh, is what helped uh, identify those wastes being deposited at Westlake. Um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission uh, took over the site uh, in the 80s, late 70s, um, and, and then in 1990, this is, this is where uh, a big problem happened. The Department of Energy uh, was in charge of what's called the Formally Utilized Sites Remedial Action Program. This was created in 1974 by Congress to address nuclear weapons, radioactive wastes in our human environment across the country including St. Louis. So the Department of Energy was in charge of this program. They came to St. Louis, they identified the downtown St. Louis site, the airport site, the Laddie Avenue site. These were all considered foods rep sites by the Department of Energy, including vicinity properties, because the Department of Energy understood that this did not just stay on the property where it was actually uh, processed or stored or dumped, what have you. Uh, the Department of Energy uh, ended up excluding the Westlake landfill from vicinity property designation, even though the radioactive waste at the landfill came from what is a foos wrap site established by the Department of Energy in 1990. So after the DOE excluded Westlake from being a foos wrap site, the uh, Environmental Protection Agency listed it on the Federal Register as a Superfund site. It's been a Superfund site ever since. In 2008, the EPA made a record of decision to leave the radioactive waste at the landfill. In 2010, uh, the EPA uh, reopened, revisited that decision. Um, the decision was to put a cap of dirt, clay, layer, construction, uh, and construction rubble and rocks on top of the radioactive waste and put groundwater monitors around the, the perimeter of the landfill. Um, important to note, there's no liner separating the radioactive material from the groundwater. Um, 2010, smoldering uh, landfill fire started, which was first reported to the Department of Natural Resources in about 2012. We found out about that fire for the first time. 2013, in March, the Attorney General uh, sued Republic Services for breaking our environmental laws. And the latest thing today, we found out the Attorney General has reached a, a, an agreement with Republic Services related to the smoldering fire. The EPA is still considering what to do with the radioactive waste as we speak. Uh, they created what was called a supplemental feasibility study to uh, see how much it would cost to excavate it and ship it away to a sanctioned facility to excavate it, leave it on site, and then to just cap it and leave it. Uh, the EPA is now in the middle of what's called the supplemental to the supplemental feasibility study. Um, so that's how we got to where we're at now in about the most nutshell way I could uh, deliver it. Um, the 2005 DNR offsite testing is what I'm going to talk about briefly. This is the uh, outline of the Westlake landfill right here. Uh, you can see uh, all these uh, uh, yellow pins mark GPS locations that we took from the document and plugged into Google Earth. So we mapped this ourselves at the Coalition for the Environment using Google Earth. Next. Uh, this is the St. Charles Rock Road. Oh, sorry. Oh, <laughs> this is the St. Charles Rock Road. Uh, this map is actually kind of old, where you see these trees right here is a lagoon right now. Um, and that's Hussman across the street. Next. This is along Banker Road, so we're just kind of right down there. Um, and that's the South Quarry at the top that's currently smoldering. This is before the cap went on, and you can still see there's vegetation on the South Quarry. Next. And then this is Tossig, um, which uh, goes north away from the landfill. Next. Um, these are the reports. I'm going to show the, we found two uh, levels of thorium-230 that were above background and one that was above um, a cleanup level established by the Environmental Protection Agency. So again, these were taken in 2005, uh, September 24th. This is the cover sheet to one of the reports. Next. Um, I believe this was also done at Everline. The same same lab where the mom sent their data or their, their samples. Uh, it says that for thorium two thirty, uh, underlined in red, to stand out that it, it, uh, samples were background to slightly positive tests for thorium two thirty. Next, 
Uh, underline the one that shows thorium-230 at 5.41. These are picogra picograms per, or picocuries per gram as well. Uh, next. This is the next report. Uh, the only difference between this one and the last one is that 9.4 at the, 9.5 at the back right there was a 9.4 in the last report. Next. Uh, again, same thing, slightly above background. Uh, this one's 8.81. Next. And this is the uh, work plan for the supplemental feasibility study that the Environmental Protection Agency approved. Um, and it was put together by the financially responsible parties at the Westlake Landfill. Uh, for thorium-230, we just saw the DNR test one at uh, 5.41 and 8.81. Uh, they established background for thorium-230 at 1.3 picocuries per gram. Next. Um, and also for uh, what would be considered remediation level. So um, 7.9 picocuries per gram for thorium. Thorium-230 and uh, 232. Next. So again, this is just showing you the, the EPA's background the remediation level, and then the one sample that we found on the rock road, or DNR found on the rock road, is 8.81. <laughs> These are the two locations that uh, those two samples that we were just talking about were found. This is a more recent picture of the landfill. You can see the South Quarry is capped right now. Um, right here, along St. Charles Rock Road, was the 8.81 picocuries per gram. Uh, again, that would have been above the EPA. Uh, remediation level set forth in the work plan for the supplemental feasibility study um, and I think at least uh, warrants uh, more investigation. Next. And uh, this is just kind of a, a map of what's going on at the landfill. I think I'm pretty much done. I put some labels on here. It's important to remember uh, that, that we have OU1 Area 2 and OU1 Area 1. Those are two sections in the landfill that are radioactive, um, at least that we know about. And, uh, well, the groundwater is contaminated too, so that's throughout the, the landfill. Um, there's more volume and radioactivity, like the literal radioactivity, there's more picocuries per gram or counts per minute or whatever, any measurement you want to put on it. There's more of that in OU1 Area 2 than there is in OU1 Area 1. The reason we've been focusing on OU1 Area 1 so much recently is because the smoldering fire's proximity to uh, where that is located. Uh, you can see uh, some of these lines through OU1 Area 1. Those are some of the paths established to uh, uh, investigate a line for the isolation barrier uh, that was negotiated between the Attorney General and the Public Services. Uh, our organization, the Missouri Coalition for the Environment, uh, we've been pressing the EPA to come up with a contingency plan for the isolation barrier. It's been eight months. They still haven't been able to find a, a clean line, an unimpacted line of, of radioactive material. The EPA has said consistently that it will not impact radioactive material when uh, creating whatever this isolation barrier looks like. We, we still have no idea. But it's been eight months. That's a considerable amount of time. And we have asked the EPA to begin planning for the removal of the radioactive wastes because it, it can be unlikely there is not able to, uh, they're not able to have an isolation barrier um, with unimpacted radioactive material in the landfill. Um, but yeah, that's all I have for right now, and I believe, uh, yeah, Don has something to say. Debbie, will you go back to that 8.81 real quick? I just really quickly, to sum up what he just said, you see that 8.81 right there? You see it right here? Right there, for thorium-230? That's been there for almost a decade. That's above remediation level. So again, we just found documents this week by DNR that have been sitting there for a decade, that it's off site at a level that needs to be cleaned up. Where is that on It's in front of Husband. They discovered it a decade ago. They discovered it a decade ago. That's right. They discovered it and it's been sitting there. People have mowed the grass over it. Don, it's Kirshner. 
Huh? Is that is that at Kirshner? Yeah. Sorry, that's across the street from Kirshner. So you guys know where Cadillac Jacks is? They tore it down. Go a little bit further east than that. So. Okay, let's bring Matt up next. You guys want to go follow? Assistant Fire Chief Matt Levanchi. I apologize for being late. We actually had a hazmat incident today on 55 that I was at all day. It's where I was sunburned. So. Um, you can go ahead if you have some of the slides there. Okay, uh, some of the things that I was asked to talk about, number one was the benzene that was reported over the last couple of weeks. Um, and the other thing was the location of the heat front in correlation with the fire that's burning somewhere in the neck, headed, headed towards the North Quarry, uh, where, and then on what would eventually be the radioactive site of Westlake. So the overview here is the carbon monoxide data for January through June. Um, and I have to say, and I don't know if anybody saw the reports from last week that, that came out. The, this month, or the bi-monthly report came out, and it appears that, according to the data that we got, that it does not look like the carbon monoxide level has increased in the North, within the North Quarry. That's good news. Uh, as I put in the report, uh, as I talked to the reporters, they asked me what my thoughts on that are, and honestly, this community should be relieved because we do not have a barrier wall that's been constructed yet. The, the non-detect or low detect of carbon monoxide means that the byproducts of that combustion have not reached a level of concern. So therefore, you have to assume that the, since there are no byproducts of combustion, there is no combustion in the North Port. That's great news. This community needs good news, and that's one of the, the things that we were able to provide. Um, right here, it's a color-coded chart, and they use the color codes, uh, if you can see it, if you can't. Uh, I believe it says that the purple one, and you, you, I can't see it as well, it's, it's less than 1,000 parts per million. Uh, and then the green is 1,001 parts per million to 2,000, I believe it is. And Actually, that's light blue. Then the green is 2001 to 3000 parts per million. But you can see in the South Quarry, in the area where the neck is, what's defined as the neck, that has different levels all throughout it. And to be honest with you, uh, <clears throat> the data reporting on that is not as crucial to me. And I believe that was referenced in the uh, Attorney General's remarks this, today with their, their negotiation and what they came to an agreement with Republic Services is that they're only going to do the uh, CO sampling in the South Quarry every other month. Um, we know that the fire is there. Our big concern is where is the fire going, how fast is it moving, and right now it appears that it's not moving very fast. And that's because we've had several rounds of CO data that have all come back as non-detect or at least less than uh, 1,000 parts per million. That's great news. So, while the combustion event still is taking place in the South Quarry, it's not moved past what the what they have installed as gas interceptor wells. I believe it's in that area, but it's not. There's no indication that the smoldering event or the fire itself that area is the past. I'm sure you guys have heard that there's been some issues with benzene and actually I got a call from MDNR a couple weeks ago, I believe it was a Thursday evening, uh, when they first noticed that they were having an issue. Um, what, what we found, uh, and I didn't respond at that time because basically I was told that the benzene level was at a relatively low rate and the thing that you have to keep in, keep in mind with benzene is while it is a very dangerous chemical, and it's massively produced, and benzene is in just about everything. When we respond on a house fire, we have encounters with benzene because everything today is made up of a chemical process that uses benzene as part of its uh, 
construction process, you know, with plastics, plastic bags, things like that. In fact, every day that you guys go to a gas station and fill up your car with gas, you're exposed to benzene. Benzene levels that are actually higher than what we found at the landfill on that Thursday night. Uh, and subsequently last week, I got another call that there was an issue that there was some utility work going on. And I have since found out that that utility work was complete gas. They were out there, they did some boreholes up and down uh, with the Bonnaker Lane right here. And actually where we found the benzene, where I found it with the monitors, was right out here in front of what used to be Dan's Automotive. And that has been bought out by Republic Services. They've taken over that property. The boreholes were on the south side of Bonnaker Lane. And actually, uh, what I was told by the representatives of the Clean Gas yesterday was that their workers, when they were digging it, they had some issues. They knew that they had something that was going on there, but they knew it wasn't natural gas. Uh, because natural gas has a chemical of methyl mercaptan that's added to it, and it's what gives natural gas its odor. Because if it didn't have that, you would never smell natural gas. That's what they put in there so people recognize when they have a gas leak. So, you know, when, when you smell what you think is natural gas, it's actually that chemical that's added to it. They knew that it wasn't that odor. So what they did was they contacted their folks, their higher-ups, and they actually came out last week and did some laboratory analysis of those boreholes where they put the holes in the ground. Uh, and unfortunately, I don't have that with me because I wasn't in my office all day because of that other call. Um, but they found, what they found was that they had levels of methane that were in that area. Well, part of the problem is, is that the not necessarily this landfill, all landfills produce methane. And uh, one of the issues that we have is it's possible that methane may be migrating from that landfill and that's why it's in the ground when they dug the holes and found through laboratory analysis that they have methane in that area. Now the benzene, um, going back to that, uh, like it says it was on May 31st, but it was also just a, a week or two ago. Uh, they called and asked if I would go down there with my sampling equipment and, and I actually used a benzene uh, monitor which basically had, it's a four gas meter but you can put a sensor on it that will specifically detect benzene. And one of the readings that I got, it was actually in a utility uh, manhole uh, through the vent cover that had, has holes bored into it. I put my sensor down under there and I got anywhere from eight parts per million of benzene up to 15 parts per million of benzene. And people that know the protocol for what is considered a yellow level event or a red level event, know that a red level event is a benzene reading of 0.5 part per million over a period of 30 minutes. Well, you guys didn't hear about the benzene thing because it wasn't an issue. Because as I did the sampling, and I want you guys to know that at no time, because I've heard a couple comments over the past couple of weeks that it's possible we were breathing benzene. Spanish Village was exposed to benzene. Uh, we may have been breathing benzene for a half an hour, six hours, we didn't know. But it's not necessarily true. The thing you have to know about benzene is when it's in its chemical form of a liquid, it's extreme, it, it evaporates extremely quickly. So this was actually a gas, benzene gas, which will evaporate even more rapidly than a liquid form. And even though I had readings of 15 parts per million, as I moved away from where I was getting those readings, it was dropping back down to zero within 20 feet of where I was getting that original reading. Doesn't mean that there's not an issue, and it doesn't mean that benzene's not bad, it just means that it was not traveling further than just 20 feet. So as you talk about being exposed to it in Spanish Village, I left that area, went up to the Spanish Village, actually I didn't go into the subdivision, just to make sure that the wind direction at the time was favorable for benzene to be carried in that direction, but I was still getting zero parts per million. So at no time was the community exposed to benzene at the release that they were talking about. Doesn't mean it wasn't there, but you guys weren't breathing. Um, so, and to the, to the fact that I didn't even feel it was necessary for me to have my respirator on when I was taking those readings. Now it was high, but I knew I wasn't going to be in it for 20 minutes, 
I also know that with benzene, the immediately dangerous to life and health level for benzene is 1,200 parts per million. So 15 parts per million wasn't going to do anything to me as long as I didn't stay in that area for a long period of time. So I wanted this community to know, and I actually asked on and, and the moms and everybody else if I could talk about that benzene release because I wanted you guys to have the peace of mind to know that even though that you heard a report that benzene was released, you guys were not in any danger. So that's why I have it. Keep talking. <laughs> okay. So what what the display shows is a uh, a running average, a high reading mark and a low reading mark during that average and the current reading. So um, if you're smelling stuff from the landfill and you're wondering what's going on in Spanish Village and if there's extra radioactivity hanging around in that cloud, we can't guarantee the accuracy, but you can go online and you see if there's a spike being reported. And it's really nice because you can see again what the average readings have been and what the high water mark is uh, and what the, the low value has been over that same uh, running average. So it works out, uh, works out pretty good. Again, we hope to have that up uh, in a week. The other thing with NetC is that it cannot tell you if it's dangerous or if it's not dangerous. It can just give you a reading um, so that you can make your own decision. So it can show you that the levels have gone up or down, but it just doesn't tell you um, if you need to leave. So. so you need to use your own judgment for that. Um, who's next? So the dangerous levels? I'm, I'm sorry? Levels that are dangerous and non-dangerous? Um, it just tells you if it goes up or down. And the levels have to do with um, what our background is, how Don explained that earlier. So Dawn might be better able to answer those questions, but okay. thank you. You're welcome. One of the one of the things you'll be able to do is look at 
nationwide other uh, radiation detectors that are out there and see what kind of numbers look average. Um, our detector, we're actually hoping, uh, is going to be more sensitive than most of the detectors out there. So our standard background level, we're hoping, is going to actually be higher. You've heard before the alpha, beta, gamma stuff, probably in other presentations. Most detectors that you can mount outdoors will only read gamma. Uh, we've taken an, a, a, a detector that will read alpha, beta, and gamma, and we have custom built an enclosure uh, so we can have it outdoors. And uh, therefore, we're probably going to be reporting higher numbers because we'll be reporting more than just the gamma, we hope, when, once, once we get these out there. Um, but you can look at the average and see, see if there's a spike that day. That's, that's kind of the initial purpose. Joe? Okay. I hope I'm not being redundant, but when you say you can decide if you need to leave, how far away do people need to go? Where do they need to go to be, to feel as if they're like, away from the you know, dirty environment? Uh, I don't have an answer to that. Uh, yeah. I, I know we're, we're uh, at some point we're going to have a presentation on what the St. Louis County evacuation plan looks like, and that may be an interesting question for us to <coughs> submit to them ahead of time. Yes? I just would say, uh, two of my friends that I work with at St. Charles, they said they were discussing the owner and benzene in one of their meetings, community meetings, and she went to it, but she didn't understand as much. I mean, are they getting as involved as we are about this? And, St. Charles, St. Charles City Council has county. has where's it? County Council. County, thank you. St. Charles County Council uh, has passed a resolution uh, asking for this whole site to be moved to Fusra. Yeah, cool? and so. and they're working with emergency responders in the area so they can have a regional response if if there is a problem. Okay, and Matt, Matt would like to address that too. Yeah, I can tell you that under the direction of Dr. Gunn with St. Louis County Health Department, the emergency responders as well as the EPA, Missouri Department of Natural Resources, um, I'm probably missing a whole bunch of them, but the Office of Emergency Management, they're working on a plan that identifies who needs to be evacuated. And, and the thing you have to keep in mind uh, is it's not just so much who needs to be evacuated, but the word evacuation itself. Because what we're dealing with is low-level radiation. And while it's not something that immediately is going to cause you health problems if you're exposed to it for the first time, prolonged periods of time of being exposed to it is going to be where you have your issues. So with St. Charles County, they have also been involved in meeting with us uh, as far as what resources they can, can not only offer us, but how they protect the folks that they have over in their side of the, the river. Um, they're part of this joint Respond. I, it, Mike is responder. The right word. It, it's it's yeah. It, it's it's a joint committee, if you will, of everybody that should be involved and at the table. So it's emergency management. It's St. Louis County Health Department. Uh, there's a side a spin off of that that's with the local hospitals that they're even looking into what the epidemiology would be and what could potentially somebody that thinks that they've been exposed to radiation present at the hospital. So even that group is looking at all this. Um, and you know, the big thing is, is that while we, do we know or are we anticipating something that happens that's gonna force this plan into effect? We don't, you know, but we wanna have it in case something does happen. We are able to tell people where not only who needs to move, but where you need to go. Because once you leave this area, we're going to need to know who was affected by it. So we're probably going to have somewhere where you, we have you meet up. And if people have family in the area, more than likely they're going to be going to those locations. But we need to be able to track people and understand what type of exposures there are um, and what type of health risks are involved with that exposure if it ever happens. And that the key word is if it ever happens. Now just on my level, people have asked me exactly what are the evacuation routes. And I want to try to address this on Facebook a couple times, but for the people that don't get on Facebook, the people that are here, we are very leery of putting in writing what the evacuation routes are. 
And the reason we do that, because at the time when this event, should it ever happen, we don't know what the weather conditions are, we don't know what the wind conditions are. The last thing in the world I'm going to do is put something in writing that tells somebody that lives in Spanish Village that they take Street X to make a right-hand turn onto Street Y and drive out to the highway because the wind could be carrying what we're talking about right to that location. And even though it may say, in the event the wind changes, follow pattern B, if we put it in writing that he says that you go and do this, it makes us liable for any health problems that may develop from exposing you unnecessarily to what's going on at the time. I hope you all understand that, but there's a lot of people out there that don't. So, as I've said on the Facebook page before, the people that will be evacuated, I hope, and they should, know the different routes in and out of not only their subdivisions, but also their places of work. You've got Tossing that runs north and south. You've got St. Charles Rock Road that runs east and west. There's a multitude of different routes that are possible. When this event happens, and I say it again, when, we're not expecting it to, but if it happens, you will be directed at that time by the police department who will be in charge of orchestrating the evacuation, what routes to take. So I hope that answers that question, but as far as putting them down in a plan, in writing, it's not going to happen. Yes, I'm sorry. What might happen if the fire reaches the uranium? Well, unfortunately, nobody has a crystal ball. And as simply as I can explain this is the radioactive material might not, not, doesn't necessarily, and we've seen it in documents by the engineers, isn't a flammable issue. But when radioactive material is heated up to the point that gas and steam are produced, which we know happen on this landfill with the current event that's happening there because they're vacuuming it underneath their tarp, and they're sending their gas to the incinerators and the flares and they're burning it off. If the mechanisms in place are not capable to handle, which, you know, when you're talking gamma radiation, it, it's very, gamma radiation is penetrable. It means it can go through things. The fortunate thing here, we're talking, one of the most dangerous items on that site is thorium-230. Correct me if I'm wrong from the people that know it. It's an alpha emitter. And if you do any research at all on radiation, you'll find out that alpha radiation does not travel long distances. That's why when they made the bomb, the thorium was the byproduct. They wanted the gamma radiation and the pure uranium because it spreads out over a bigger area. I'm not saying that it's not going to travel, but alpha emitters or alpha radiation does not travel nearly as far as the other types of radiation that there are. If a fire gets to that impacted area, which I pray to God it doesn't, because that's why we're doing everything we're doing as far as a barrier wall and everything else to keep it from happening. But the smoke potentially carries the, the particles, and we're talking you're very, very small. You know, it's atoms that we're talking about that are radioactive. If it leaches into the smoke or into the steam, the first thing you have to, to realize is while their gas collection system may send it to an incinerator, an incinerator doesn't burn off radioactive material. It's released into the air. And depending on which way the wind blows, that at that particular time, that would be our main counter or our main focus of how do we counteract against a wide-scale release of radioactive material. If we'd have St. Louis County Health involved, we would be doing air monitoring, but we would be doing everything we can to protect the largest number of people and make sure that they're kept out of harm's way. And that, that's as simply as I can state it. Uh, now that I've had an opportunity to think a little bit more <laughs> about the question that uh, Representative Shu has, the monitors that we're putting up, uh, the thought behind that is if, if you smell something in your neighborhood and you're concerned, you can go online, you can see if these things are, are picking anything up. If, if they're not picking anything up, it doesn't mean there's nothing there. But if you see something and the county has not told you to evacuate, 
then you probably want to have your kids play in the house that day. So it's really more, it's not where to go, it's, it's more like an ozone level alert. It's more there's, there's pollution out in the air, but indoors you're probably just fine. Uh, as you heard, the alpha uh, particles are low energy, but they're really bad if you inhale them. Uh, they're not going to come through your walls of your house. They're not going to make it. Um, so it's more of an advisory to, to take your kids indoor that day. Gears here for a moment. Um, as an observer uh, and as part of, of Bill Otto's staff, citizen involvement and input has had a great positive impact on moving the issues at this site forward to resolution. I know we're not at resolution yet, but when we were first called upon to get involved, um, generally speaking, the facts weren't coming to uh, the table. Uh, the people in charge weren't necessarily uh, recognizing the severity of the situation or paying attention to all the details that they should. And through citizen involvement and citizen activity, we have taken this, you, the community, has taken this issue uh, very far in a very short period of time, and I applaud everyone's efforts for that. Uh, Representative Otto, it, it, as you all know, there's, there's a uh, primary and uh, one office being elected uh, in August. And uh, Representative Otto is sponsoring the meeting that we'd like to invite you all to. We encourage you to wear your t-shirts if you have them. It's important to let all of the, the uh, elected officials that will be there and the potentially uh, elected officials if they win, uh, to let them know your concerns, to let them know that you vote, to let them know that you are their community and you're holding them accountable for making sure that you're kept safe in this issue is not swept under the rug like it had like it had been in the past. It stays in the forefront of their minds and their duties to this community. So we encourage you to show up. Creep Court Lake, um, this is not a fundraiser. This is strictly a meet and greet. Come out and let these people know that this is an important issue to you and therefore an important issue to them. Uh, we're going to have hot dogs and soft drinks. Um, <coughs> Rain or shine, we have the big shelter that's over near the uh, boathouse. And uh, any questions? Did I cover that okay? Good. Hope to see everyone there. Okay, now I get to spin my hat one more time. <laughs> and uh, we have a, uh, uh, a, a special. Uh, event, I guess, that we want to talk about is a special presentation. Uh, and for that, I'm going to call up uh, State Representative Jill Shu. <laughs> well, I just wanted to say that also tonight we have Linda Eager from Bridgeton, who showed up. And we also have Bill Ray from Charlie Dewey's office. Good evening. So glad you're here, and I wish we were here for a different reason, but you're the people who are going to make change in this important issue in, the, in this community, so um, I congratulate and applaud you. One of the people in the state legislature who has led the charge to make sure that attention has been brought to this issue, uh, has been a tremendous advocate for cleaning up our environment and for doing what needs to be done for the people of 
his community, your community, our community, is, uh, has been designated for his efforts as the Legislator of the Year, and I'd like to invite up and congratulate Representative Bill Otto. Um, and but it can happen. 
Um, the Republicans, Democrats have transferred sites in their districts over to FUSRAP. Um, we have a Republican and a Democratic senator, and actually the, uh, the congressional district for, for Lacey Clay and Ann Wagner literally splits the Westlake landfill in half. This is the, the epitome of a bipartisan effort uh, that is going to be needed to, to put the core in charge. So we think they've got the expertise. They've been handling this radioactive material all over town. The St. Louis site's a core site. The Laddie Avenue site's a core site. The, the, the airport site's a core site. It was, it was bureaucratic shenanigans in 1990 that led the DOE, the Department of Energy, to not putting the Westlake landfill on the FUSRAP listing where it belongs. And there are advantages to it being a FUSRAP site. They have literally entire core of engineers to work on this. They are the ones that, that do the site study and investigation. Under Superfund, the responsible parties hire their own contractors to do this work. There's a conflict of interest there. Um, the, the Corps of Engineers, once they're finished with sites, they, they go back to the Department of Energy in what's called the, the Office of Legacy Management. If Westlake is, remains a Superfund site, it will be the, uh, the, the stepchild of all the other radioactive wastes in St. Louis. It will, it will well, we want it to be our Cinderella, right? We want it to be, <laughs> become a food wrap site. Uh, so that's all I have to say about that. Sign the letters and, and let's get this turned over to the Corps of Engineers where we can get meaningful scientific investigations into this and hopefully uh, the removal of the radioactive wastes and have them sent to a sanctioned facility for their long-term uh, stewardship. Thank you. Okay, so now we have Q&A. If anybody has any questions, raise your hand. And nobody has, oh, Todd. Uh, I have a, another question about the, the background as far as the monitors are concerned. On the, uh, the netc.com.net, is that, is that going to have like a base background for this particular area? I know you said that it's hard to get a good reading but uh, is it going to be something that uh, you'll, you'll say that background in this area is uh, five and all of a sudden it spikes to an eight? Should that be a concern? The question was, is it going to, I'm sorry, <laughs> is it going to have a background level here with monitors? And the, the way NetC operates is that NetC calculates its own background so it may not be the same background levels as Dawn pointed out with the Department of Energy, FUSRAP, and um, the EPA. What it's going to do is it's going to calculate its own background level um, for the location that it's at, and we, we will have one upwind and one downwind. To do is what we put like together um, a chart so that people can understand what those readings mean, and then we will have that posted on the website as well as Facebook. It's going to take, I believe it's three months for it to calculate its average, um, and that's a constantly running. So over the course of three months, if you see a reading that says a 52, don't freak out. <laughs> um, because sometimes it can go down to 26. It, it's going to take that average every day for those three months and form its baseline. And then from there, you'll be able to tell if it's going to jump up or if it's lower. And again, that's only based on the air from that monitor. That's not based on the EPA's data or FUSRAP or um, the Department of Energy. So I think what we'll have to do also is um, investigate a little bit more what those actual background levels that we're taking, how they, they compare to the other levels. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. And when they're up and running, we are probably, the, the meeting after that that comes up, we will be showing you that. We will show you examples, what we're getting from that. So don't take that and think that's all you're getting. You will be seeing more of that. So while you're thinking of questions, I have a question I think Matt might be able to answer. I don't know. He mentioned today about he was informed that Laclede gas was digging. We just found out it's off-site. Why are utility people digging? Because I don't believe they probably had anything on. 
that would be safety, correct? That's why they left the site. That just worries me because we've got MSC and McLean and Ameren and all the others that are digging around the sites. Are they informed that they're digging next to contaminated areas? Well, I, I mean, I can tell you what, what I did when I went out there and investigated was the burners. The area that I saw, the area that I saw had the largest quantities of benzene that day. Um, we're in, in what was, it's so old that it was called the Southwestern, it said Southwestern Bell on the manhole that was there. So it's at and There's a sign there that has, in an emergency or for information, call this number with at and on it. It had actually a number on the side of the sign that identified the manhole cover or the manhole that the utility access. So between myself and person at the MDNR, we contacted those people to let them know that, and I was worried about it because on this particular day, it was Friday, uh, last Friday, and I was worried about it. I said, Murphy's Law is they're going to have telephone outage or something, and somebody's going to open up that cap and go in and try to splice a wire or whatever. So we wanted to make sure that AT&T at least knew that there was high levels of benzene in that immediate area. Um, so we did that. Uh, I had no idea that Laclede Gas was doing an investigation into it. Um, they were out there, I believe, what I was told by the person that called me uh, with Laclede, Laclede Gas, is they were just doing routine work to check to make sure that their main line that runs and services that whole uh, corporate part that's back there, they, they were just doing some work because those pipes were actually very old. And you actually, if you opened up and took the wood off the hole and it wasn't big enough to fit a person down inside, I think they were just doing some spot checking to make sure they weren't having issues with their old lead pipe that they were running. Because the Laclede Gas in the last 10 or 15 years have been switching over from running their gas supply through metal pipe, which can break down and has issues into a PVC type pipe. And that's what they, usually the mains are fed with the PVC. In this particular case, you could see that it was the old stuff. So it, it was probable, and I'm just guessing, that they were looking at changing their infrastructure to bring it up to code and to be more safe in that area. So, But yes, they do know that there's issues. And, and the other thing, as they told me, in not just this particular landfill, but in all landfills, they have issues with methane that seeps underground. It's called migraine. Uh, issue, they have migration issues with gas getting off of site, off the location, and you know, he just, he, and I have to say, I have, my hat's off to Laclede Gas because they called us to inform the first responders that there's an issue there that, of having methane higher than what it should be, which is zero, so. Gene, uh, are you talking about uh, right here by bankers, um, you know, house that sits on the hill? That's where they were digging down there by the automotive um, yes. transmission. Yes, from corporate right. exchange west. Yeah, right. Well, I'm a long-time resident of Spanish Village. Mm -hmm. So my question is, I've been here 25 years. They were going to build a huge you know, Mr. Banker was going to build a huge transmission line right there. Mm -hmm. Is that what No, no, no. Dan's Automotive is on the west, southwest corner of the landfill. You want to throw that map up there? No. I was just wondering if that property by Bank, you know, that would work. Is it coming out of Yeah, if you see the yellow pin that's the furthest south or down towards the bottom, that just that sits, the yellow pin is pinned on the southwest corner of the landfill. Just straight down from there where you can see the, what looks like gravel, that's Dan's Automotive. They've taken that over and they bought out Dan. I don't, I don't know if they bought him out or if he used to lease or he leased that land, but they've acquired that piece of property. Okay. That area right there is where we had the benzene levels. Well, Clean Gas came in and did took five samples out of their boreholes that they put in and sent all those to the lab and it came back that they were had it was not natural gas. It was methane. Right. I saw him working there uh, the other day when I was walking, yeah. so I was just all right, I've got an acceptor. Thank you. Thanks. Were they uh were they found the thorium two thirty on the rock road at high
higher levels. Did they mark that off so people are aware not to be around that area because it was previously shown to have high levels? Are people still walking around cutting that grass? No, they didn't mark it off. It's been there for a decade, just sitting there. These were surface samples, which are nothing further down than six inches. So, it's usually that's almost that property right there. You know, if it, depending on where it is on the side of the road, it could be uh, the county, I would guess, would own St. Charles Rock Road. Modat, Modat. Yeah, or it's a state road, depending on how far up on the property. But no, it's not. It's above remediation levels, and it's been there for almost a decade. And you know, until Ed threw it and I poured through it, and some of the other people they didn't know. It's important to point out kind of what Matt and what uh, Beth were talking about. One, when we ask for food threat to be in charge of this site throughout North County, you know, you know that this stuff came from Lady Avenue and the airport sites, and a lot of those properties and those ditches are contaminated. One of the really neat things about food threat is that. No utility work can happen without food threat being there. Does that make sense? Like they oversee all that, which is another reason why out here it's really important that we get the St. Louis Army Corps involved with this site. So. And one thing I wanted to add on this, uh, every Monday morning we have a uh, telecon where we discuss uh, the weekend events, that the potential odor causing events, and various things that happen. And uh, last Monday there was a discussion of this digging uh, either off-site or in some areas. And with the discussion of this um, uh, off-site uh, material that's been found, we went to the AG's office at, that morning, in fact, and asked them to order them to stop until they could determine whether or not they were digging in the right spot. Now, I'm concerned about the workers as well, but I am just as concerned, if not more, that they're going to stir something up somewhere, being in some place they're not supposed to be, or where they don't even really know what's there and getting something airborne. Uh, the AG's office, I think, did their due diligence with the D DNR. They, they were at some, uh, they called federal f facilities. But the fact of the matter is, they did investigate, they did do it, and I think that they were ready to, start, to either stop them or to clear them one, one, one way or the other. And I understood that they had stopped the digging, but the fact of the matter is, the, a the AG's office, I thought, reacted. Uh, quickly and responsibly when we ask them, you know, I don't have any, any any expertise, but I don't care if you're digging and you don't know what's there around this area, you should be digging. So, just say that. That was what I was saying. Okay, yes. Did everybody hear that? No. I would tell you that you could call me, but I would just turn around and call DNR. DNR is the regulatory authority over the landfill, over the south neck in the north quarry. The EPA is involved with the Westlake landfill itself, where the radioactive material, most of it is, and some of it has moved from there, as we know. I would suggest that you contact DNR, but I, I know that that is not always successful. So, I have, if there's something that you feel out of, is out of the ordinary, I'm going to tell you. You guys can call me anytime. That my phone is always on. When I'm not in my office, it rings to my cell phone, which is on me 24/7. So Saturday, Sunday. Saturday, Sunday, and if you don't, if you, if I don't answer right away, you will at least hear back from me. So. You, you can call me anytime. I've got DNR's number on my screen, uh, believe me. If you've got anything you don't know about or we don't know about, um, they was, and they do respond pretty well. So, okay. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, they respond to Bill and I very rapidly. But I know that people have had issues with contacting DNR and not getting answers and things like that. So, yeah, they will definitely answer us. We have the right phone numbers. Call this number because we don't have a we don't have anything in place as far as a 
infant. Right, well, and, you know, and I, I understand that the yeah. people that live immediately in this area yeah. are on pins and needles. I get it because you have got you guys have gone through so much in the last two and a half years, and you know it's actually been going on longer than that. You just didn't know about it, um, but you guys have gone through so much that I understand. You know, when I and I don't get on Facebook every day, but I check it periodically and I get notified when there's a new post. And if there's something that I can answer a question, I do that. But I've also looked at that Facebook page and when the question is asked, I pick up my phone and call my contact at DNR and say, this is what the people are saying. I haven't been by there yet, but I'm on my way. What's going on? And I'll, I'll be honest with you, a lot of times, DNR doesn't know. They're not notified. And that's that's the biggest problem I have is the lack of communication between the company there and the first responders. Because when things go bad, you know, the, you guys are going to call 911. The dispatcher is going to answer the phone. They're going to push a button, and my trucks are going to roll out the door. Now, we have stepped up our protocol as far as pub, our uh, personal protective gear and our equipment that we use, I mean, we will not go on the landfill now as first responders without a four gas meter. It's just, we, that's the only place we do that. Because even if we get a, besides a notice or a call for uh, gas in a residence or a CO detector going off, but even on an EMS call, somebody has chest pain at the offices, our guys come off the trucks and their four gas meters are on just because we don't know the reason they're having chest pain is because there's been an exposure. So, you know, it, I understand that you guys are on pins and needles. I just want you to know that myself, the fire chief, the on-duty battalion chief, there's, we're open 24-7, 365. We all have phones. You guys are all welcome to call us. And it, 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 it's very easy. 314-393 uh, in our department number is 4800. So 393-4800 will get you the fire chief. 393-4801, or four, I'm sorry, 4807 will get you me. Our battalion chief that's on duty 24-7 is 314-393-4802. So you can call any number in that 4800 series and you will get somebody with the fire department. And if they're not the right person to talk to, they will get a hold of the right person to talk to and put you in contact. Yeah, absolutely. That's a resource for everybody that lives in Bridgeton. You all have elected officials, even at that local level, that are concerned about what your concerns are. So, yeah, there's several neighbors that call about non so, you know, there's Spanish village, or two. So, just a real brief, quick add on. Um, that 8.8 .8 reading, it was mentioned earlier, that 2005 document uh, is a very interesting document. The reason that the community went after that document is because Director Brooks cited that document when the uh, press release, when he did the press conference <clears throat> at the Bridgeton Landfill, um, at the Bridgeton City Council, uh, announcing that they were going to test BMAC. And he cited that document as an example of why EPA has not been concerned about this material being off-site. Now, what Ed pointed out was a very interesting little nuance in there. And that nuance was that, that there were two documents. The first one he showed you had the 4 point something and the 5 point something, and the second one had the 8.1. And if you look at the cover of those documents, the only difference is the sequence number from 94 to 95. Uh, to, you know, 001294, 0012395. Um, I think what happened is EPA only read the first document, they didn't read the second document. The second document had the 8.8 .8 in there. And the other thing that's interesting about that is this past Monday night at a public meeting, again, EPA said, and this is the uh, project manager for the site from EPA, said when we brought this document to their attention, 
that he had never seen that document before and was not even aware of the 8.81 number. Okay. So in answer to your question, who do you call, what do you do about this, and is, uh, is the area marked off right now? Call your federally elected officials, tell them you want that area cleaned up and you want it cleaned up yesterday. Okay, Chuck. More of a comment. The CAC meeting and had the EPA here. Do you really make this or do you think they're doing their job or do you think the Attorney General is stepping in doing what they should be doing? Because it just does not seem that the EPA is doing what they should. The Attorney General is stepping in doing their job. Can you answer that? Did everybody hear that? It seems to me the Attorney General is doing their job. <laughs> He asked if the EPA was doing their job. Oh, they're sitting on their butts. That's what they're doing. If you were at the CAD meeting on Monday, you would have seen that firsthand that they really didn't know what they were talking about. Five minutes on TV, you learned more tonight from the Attorney General than we learned from the EPA for two hours. That's two hours ago. I think it's about time the VA got it right. They got rid of their top up. Region 7. I think we did send questions to Doug and the CAD member on to do that and say, hey, why don't we ask Carl Brooks to resign? I think it's time for him to go. We need to do this. Okay, so I'm actually going to close right now. Dawn's going to say something after I close, and then you. Yes. She has over there. These are all soil borings done at Westlake. The thorium 230, that's 8.1 up here. There's a there's a level in here that's in the 57,300 sitting on the surface. There's a 265 on the surface. This is thorium 230 sitting on the surface at Westlake. Okay, that was not always covered with vegetation. So is it along the hall route? Yes. Is it from the hall route? I don't really think it matters. Does that make sense? I think that. We have a, My thinking is, is it was, with that push, because he was trying to get the machines done on the whole route, right. the EPA pushed back that they've done it before, even though they can't find that document from the last time around. Yeah, what they're, I think they're trying to do is they're trying to grab a food strap and pull them in by their ear and say, uh-oh, we got it along the hall route, and guess what? You guys have all the other hall routes, so you come do this one bring them to the gates of Westlake Landfill, and then it looks a little asinine as to why who's reps here and nothing's being done up here when you have, I don't want to say these are low readings, they're not good readings off-site people, but you've got very high surface level readings and even higher in area too, so it makes no sense why who's rep, if they're out there cleaning the hall routes and cleaning that up, why would they be on top of the landfill removing it? So I think that's the logical thing that he's getting at, and that's the thing that have to remember it very well could have fallen off the back of the truck we know it did all over north county but at this point as a community we focus on the fact that it's there it's off-site it's been there it's been there for 40 years and they've known about it for a decade so well they say so but i had it i that they were provided the documents by the attorney general and by dnr and they didn't read them yeah. I was meeting the CAD meeting the other night, and it, it was it, it was very sad because the guy just kept saying either I don't know or that's not my department or yeah I I'd have to ask somebody else. And it, it, 
why aren't they sending somebody who knows something and that can answer the questions? Can we ask that the people who should know these things be? Wait, Ron was feeling this treasure of the CAG, and I know the CAG can make a lot of requests. Um, you know, that would be something probably to be because I kind of was like, we're wasting time to listen. Everybody asking questions, and he goes, I don't know. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and close, and then I guess John is done talking. If anybody wants to stay after, we've got you know elected officials here. We've got um, Matt, so you can come up and we'll stay until you, our questions are answered. So I wanted to thank you again for coming out tonight. I would like to remind you to sign the letters that Ed talked about on the table, if you haven't, to the elected officials and the AG. Um, I would like for you to call or email your local elected officials about the day, the day in the life of living and work, living and or working next to this contaminated landfill. Let them know how it is affecting you and your families. It is a part of our everyday lives now, a monkey on our backs. We are fighting for this community. We all feel and understand the fear and anxiety we are faced every day. It sometimes feels like the landfill controls our every move. Can we barbecue tonight? Or jumping out of the shower because we heard sirens approaching? Or taking kids to the park? Or just sitting outside on many of the great restaurant patios in Bridgeton and across the river in historic St. Charles? As a community, we are agreeing that safety is our first priority. We will not stand by and allow a multi-billion dollar trash owner to decide, based on their wallets and their shareholders, what the next steps are. We do not want our concerns to be dismissed. I wanted to remind everyone tonight about the building, building that we are in and what it represents. The International Union of Operating Engineers Local 513's motto is Labor Conquers All. I believe we share that motto. We work daily on this, eyes wide open. Thank you again for being the community that you are and for having the strength and having the courage. We will stand together. We will demand what is right for our children our homes and property. If you want to help, these are the ways you can do that. Make calls, tweet, you can look that up if you know what that means. <laughs> Write letters, email elected officials, educate others, share website, participate in the 4th of July parade in for Bridgeton. Please see Megan down here. She needs people to be in the parade. Share on Facebook. Attend CAG meetings. Next one is July 24th. Attend prayer vigils with the Franciscan Sisters of Mary. The next one is June 25th. The Spanish Village Mobile Home Park condos have a neighborhood meeting. Please see Kathy and Chuck. The meet and greet is July 2nd at Creek Corps Lake to talk to your elected officials and let them know how it is living here. And we will see you back here on July 17th for our next meeting. Thank you.